Good morning. Again, thank you for joining us this morning for uh, our Sunday morning worship service. Uh, today we are looking at Romans 8, verses 31 through 39. Romans 8, verses 31 through 39. And again, thank the pray, uh, th I just want to say thank you to our praise team, and I know you have been enjoying uh, the music that they have been giving, uh, been sharing with us and helping us worship in, in music and and song and, and, and just uh, coming together uh, as, we, as, as we worship in spirit and in truth and, and worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, as you heard in the beginning of our uh, in my beginning announcement that we are looking to uh, plan on right now the second Sunday of June of starting our worship service back. Uh, it will not have Sunday school, but we will have worship service uh, and uh, we'll make things as as, as uh, safe as possible for everyone. We will, uh, you know, in the church, we'll have every other pew kind of taped off so people can, social, can separate out a little bit. And uh, uh, we'll try that uh, in, in our first Sunday. And again, if you are not ready or don't feel safe returning back to church uh, or have any symptoms, uh, let me encourage you uh, to stay at home, to stay put. We don't want you to do anything that you would feel or feel like you have to do anything that would feel like you would compromise uh, your, your, yourself, your loved ones, or put you or your loved ones at risk. And we want to reiterate that every time. As we begin to look at Romans 8.31, it begins with, What then? Shall we say in response to these things, and what things? Well, the things that we've been talking about, they're all in the previous verses, through chapter 8. Now, you'd have to go back and listen to all the different little messages to get all the little things out of it. But these verses challenge us, this verse challenge, to put the truth of the, pressure, of, of the Word of God to the test, to put to, into practice the things of the Word of God, make them applicable in our lives, to live by faith, believing that these things are true. And they are true. You know, where you, where you, you know, the thing about truth is, truth is true whether you believe it or not. The truth is always true. Whether you believe it or not, the truth is always true. Now, I said last week, I gave you the, that, about the five points of our eternal security. I talked a little bit of it, I talked about it, getting, you know, uh, you know, talk about uh, a, a three point or four point security system in, in our home or our business. And we have a five point security system, and it's really five works of God that complete our salvation and they are all in the past tense. So, and while they, they are still at work right now in our lives, the, the whole process is still at work, we can live as though they have already been completed. That's why they're in the past tense. Yeah, basically, and the reason we can live with them as in the past tense because God has already determined, God has predetermined, these things will take place, these things are going to happen. God has said, I will cause these things to happen. They are guaranteed. God has declared it. And he's the only sovereign one in the universe. He is the only one who is, has control over all things, past, present, and future. All things created in heaven and earth powers and principalities, dominions, uh, the kings, uh, pr uh, the president. He is in charge. God is in charge of everything, visible and invisible. So God has already, as we talk about last week, predetermined where the journey will end for his creation. Now, there's two destinations that God has determined. Those who have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, their final destination will be the lake of fire. Eternal separation from God. But those who have received Jesus Christ, who have confessed with their mouth and believed in their heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, ask him to come into their heart, forgive them of their sins, and be their Lord and Savior, their, your final destination will be the new Jerusalem the new heaven and the new earth. The Bible tells us that this old present heaven and earth will one day pass away. It's going to be destroyed. That's way on out in the future. And then God's going to create a new heaven, a new earth. 
and then the new Jerusalem will be in the new heaven and new earth. Now, how do we know that where our eternal journey will end? Well, there again, if we, I've talked about this, and I, I speak about it all the time in my messages. Do you have the Holy Spirit in your heart? Does Jesus Christ, when, Jesus, when, when we ask Jesus to come into our heart, he sends the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, takes up residence now in our heart. The Bible tells us, that as a child of God, we are the temple of God. The Holy Spirit lives in us. Every believer in Christ is now a temple in whom God lives. So we have the witness of the Holy Spirit, and we know he's there because he is witnessing, he is speaking to our hearts and our spirits and guiding us, letting us know what is right, wrong, what is, you know, uh, a lot of times it, that, he, he speaks in this through that still small voice. So we know we have the Spirit because of his witness to us and his leading us and, you know, and he's helping us to put faith and trust in the promises of God. Now, the second part of, of Romans 8.31 is what I would call Exhibit 1. The, I've titled the message, uh, ba the basic part of the, the, of the message is uh, the exhibits of our victory. The exhibits. And exhibit one is, says this, a, a last part of verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? You know, the true born again children of God, we, you live day by day by living and trusting in the assurances uh, that God is going to be there helping us through those difficult times, those difficult decisions, the, 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 the things that we face in life. Whatever obstacles, mountains, challenges uh, that come into our life, we, we trust God has an answer, that God will help us through them. He'll give us the ability to overcome, the courage to be strong, the power uh, that we need to be faithful. Everything that we need, we are trusting God. Or whatever, whatever this world throws at us and our enemies of God throws at us, we trust that God will give us the power to overcome. He's in charge of those things. He's in charge of the outcome. <clears throat> and the outcome is part of his divine will. We trust in that. Now, and we trust it regardless of where we understand it. Now, they are, let, me, let me just say, there are things that happen we don't truly understand why and how they happen. Or why they have, you know, why they happen to this person, not to that person. Why? The, the, the things happen to, over here and not over there. We don't understand many of those things. But yet we know that God is still in control. We don't see how they can be a part of God's divine plan, but yet by faith we trust God in them. We know he is sovereign and in control. Now, you know, God never promised to take away our pain, our difficulties, our suffering, our trials in life, but he has promised to be with us through them. He has promised that we can uh, trust uh, God through in them. If, you know, you know, if God, and this is a, pre a previous uh, sermon, if God has permitted them, everything is either caused by God or permitted by God. And either way, God has a purpose for them. If God has permitted something that's hurtful or painful, that's difficult, a trial in our life, then God has a purpose for it, for allowing it. So we never had to go through trials alone. We never had to go through uh, the trials without God's help us in them. Now, as I said in the past, the ultimate destination that we are working toward it's in previous verses where it says that God is working to conform us to the image of his son. Everything that God allows or causes, permits or causes in our life is to bring us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. To improve our faith or to prove our faith, to strengthen our faith, to grow us as his child. You know, one of the ways that we know that we are a true born-again child of God is that relationship, that intimate personal relationship we have 
with God. John 17, 3 says this, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That no is that intimate, personal relationship that we that you have with a, you would have with another person. That you have an intimate, not a, an intimate personal knowledge of that person because there you have this close relationship with them. Well, that is the know God. It's not just knowing about God, believing that there is a God out there somewhere, or even believing that Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, well, yeah, well, God had a son. His name was Jesus, and he's out there somewhere. This, that, yeah. It is if you don't have a personal, intimate relationship with God with the Holy Spirit at work in your heart and life, then you need, you need to check out your salvation, whether you're really saved or not. See, we, you know, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. And also the Holy Spirit is one with Jesus and the Father. And you cannot come into a relationship with the Father and the Son without the help, express help of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who carries God's call. He is the power that works in our lives to bring it to, to help bring us into the image of Jesus Christ. He is the one that working and he is the help. He's the counselor. Uh, he is the power of God at work in you. And we are told in John 16 8, what he does, he convicts the world of sin, rises to judgment. One of the things that the Holy Spirit will be doing in your life will be convicting you of sin. That conviction of sin, if you're a child of God, will lead to repentance. Repentance is a part of being a child of God. Repenting, repenting of sin. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Where does that conviction come from? Well, it comes from the Holy Spirit at work in our life. As we read God's word, as we hear God's word, as we meditate in, in times of prayer upon God's word, the Holy Spirit will take the word of God, however we have received it in, through reading or hearing, uh, uh, and, and coming in contact with it, he will use it to convict us of sin. And, that should, and if we are a child of God, it will lead to repentance. See, those who are lost, they're not worried about repentance. They don't feel convicted by other sin. But the children of God have that conviction in their hearts. Now, verse 32 is exhibit two of our victory. How, and it's how we know that God's grace is greater than our sin. It says this in Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If God loves you and I so much, I'm here's the reasoning behind it. If God loves you and I so much that he did not hold back his very own son, but freely gave him up for us, why would he withhold anything good from us and not give us everything else that we need? If he has already gave us the most precious, the most valuable possession, or the most valuable thing he could ever give for us, which is the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, dying on a cross, suffering a, 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 this unimaginable torment and pain and suffering for us. Would he, why would God withhold anything good? You know, it's kind of like, it's just say you entered a kind of, I don't want to make this sound cheap, our salvation, but if you uh, say, uh, say, say you won a car in a contest and you went to pick up that car and you got in the car and you look and there's no keys to crank the car or there's no battery to crank the car or maybe something else is missing, but they just say the keys are missing. He said, well, where's the keys? And, then, and well, what they told you? Well, you didn't win the keys. You won the car. That doesn't make any sense. If you won the car, you won the keys, right? Why would God give us his son, freely give us his son, and withhold those other things? We need? There is nothing greater than God giving to us, Jesus Christ. There is nothing that you could ever receive that's any greater than, than, than the very gift of 
eternal life that God has given to us through his son, Jesus Christ. So why would God withhold anything else good from us? It doesn't make sense. You know, James told us that every good gift, every perfect gift is from our Father above. Now, and so it reminds us that God is responsible and God is the cause of every good thing that comes into your life. Now, God permits the struggles, the difficulties, the hardships, the things we don't like in our life, but God is one, he is, he's the one who causes all the good things to come into your life. And there's a difference. If there's, if there's a difficulty, there's a trial, a sickness, or, or a hardship, or something coming down, God has permitted it. If God had not permitted it, or if God has permitted it, then he has a purpose for it, for us to learn, learn, something, in, learn something from that. You know, let me go back to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus one more time. Jesus tarried his coming to Lazarus. I mean, they sent word to him. Jesus tarried till Lazarus had been in the grave four days. Jesus permitted Lazarus to go ahead and suffer death and be buried. Why did he permit it? That seemed like a horrible thing to permit. You know, because even... Uh, Mary and Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. Why did God permit it? What was, what is one of those phrases, that, what is that, the, the phrases that we use and we repeat all the time? Jesus says what? I am the resurrection and the life. He permitted, God permitted the Lazarus to die to show Lazarus, and, not, and Lazarus, and who's already dead in the tomb, but Mary, Martha, all those around her, that he is the resurrection life. He permitted it to, to show them a truth that they needed to know, a truth that they needed to see, a, a truth that would give them strength in their times of difficulty, strength, that they would get, help them in their times of, of weakness and struggle and difficulty, that Jesus is the resurrection of life. Well, God has permitted the same things to happen to us. That he has a reason for us so that we can learn that he is all powerful. He is all knowing. You know, there is no one greater than he. <clears throat> Romans 8 28 is a familiar verse that we repeat up many times. And we know, we know, we know. That all things work together for the good of those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God has promised that we will lack nothing. That when we reach that final destination, that we will be like Jesus. We'll be whole, complete, lacking nothing. And we will be the glorified body of Christ. Boy, I tell you, I don't know about you. I look forward to that one day. Although we go through the struggles in this life and difficulties, but one day we're going to be made whole, complete, glorified, lacking nothing. God's promised He'll give us all things that we need to get there. You know, on that trip uh, to that final destination. We will lack nothing. God will freely give us all things that are needed for that to get to get us there. Whatever strength or wisdom or hope or faith or grace or understanding, ability, courage, or anything else you need, God will supply freely. And that is an exhibit of our victory. You know, when David faced Goliath, a very favorite uh, story from the Bible, and I hate to use the story, it, it's, it, it's an eyewitness account. It truly happened. Many times people think of stories of being something that's made up. This is not made up. This actually happened. This was a real event in history. But when David faced Goliath, it was God who gave him faith, courage, and ability to defeat that giant with one single stone. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced death, if they did not bow down and worship the image of Nebuchadnezzar, it was God who gave them the strength, the courage, the faith, the ability to stay strong, the hope, 
to stay strong. You know, what, what, what did they tell Nebuchadnezzar? He says, you know, whether our God saves us or not, we will not bow. We believe our God is able, <clears throat> but whether he saves us or not, that's in, we are in his hands. And so we had to have that same thing because we all love that story because, you know, old Nebuchadnezzar, he threw, them, he threw, he threw the Shadrach, Meshach, had him thrown in there, had the furnace heated up so hot that it killed the soldiers that threw them in the fire. And when Nebuchadnezzar got close enough to look in there, and he said, wait a minute, didn't we just throw three people in there? There's a fourth person in there. And he has the appearance as a son of God. And old Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, guys, would you kind of mind please stepping back out here? And because they came out. Now, we love that story because... But we, we hope we have that kind of victory when we go through in our trials. But not every trial ends in a victory. You know, when you look through the, we go through the heroes of faith in chapter 11, there were many that died. Was their faith any less than those who had great victories? You know, you, you've got those in there that talks about had these great victories, but you had others who were sawn in two. They were, fed, they were killed by wild animals, fed to lions, burned. They were burned alive at the stake. Was their faith any less than the ones who had great victory? Absolutely not. Do not think that they had less faith. Those pe the, the people who are suffering today, don't think that they have less faith is the reason they have their su the suffering they're going through. Because someone gets cancer or someone dies at an early age or things happen. Don't think that someone else had less faith because those things happened. So we make a mistake in doing that many times. <clears throat> I can't explain why God allows those, some of those things to happen. I can't understand. I can't explain to you that. But all I can do is tell you that if God has permitted it, God has a purpose for it. I can give you a, one personal example. Uh, my father-in-law, Ham's dad, Died with cancer, prostate cancer, at an early age, in his early 60s. After he was diagnosed with prostate cancer, during those early years, my father-in-law accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior and was baptized and joined the church. He became a child of God. Cancer is a terrible disease. But it's better to have cancer and be saved and to die with cancer and be a child of God than to live healthy and free and bust hell wide open or to be thrown in the lake of fire. I'm not thankful for cancer, but I'm thankful that God was able to use that cancer to save my father-in-law that I, one day I will see him in heaven. That is just a personal example. So as we face life's difficulties and challenges in the world and the enemies of God come against us, God will supply the answer, the strength, the wisdom, the faith, the courage, the grace. He will supply whatever we need. We will lack nothing when we stand and face those challenges. Acts 1 8 says this you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That was the promise to the disciples. And it's a promise that when we have the Holy Spirit in us, we have the power to be the witnesses of God. We have the power to stand strong and be faithful. Exhibit three of our victories in verse 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Let me look at, look at this. How can you look at this this, this way? This does not say that the world and even the image of God won't try to silence, mistreat, kill, abuse, even destroy you in this life. 
But remember, as a child of God, we're looking to that future destination. We live not for this life, but for the life to come. If we are living only for what we receive in this life, then this life is all we have. But that doesn't mean we cannot have things or enjoy a good life in this life. But our, final, our, our real destination, the Bible says, do not love the world or the things of the world for all that's in the world, the lust of the eye, lust of flesh, pride of life, is, is not of God but of, 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 of the evil one. We got to have to watch out how we put our affections. Jesus said, where your heart is, there your treasures will be also. As a child of God, and that's another way we know that we are a born-again child of God. We're looking to that future home. We're looking at that future place. What does it say about Abraham? Abraham was looking for that city whose architect and whose builder was God. He realized that he was just a sojourner on this earth. Abraham had great wealth, great prosperity, and favor with God while on this earth. But yet, he knew this earth. He didn't live for this world. He was just passing through this world. He looked into that future, future home, that eternity of that new Jerusalem and that city of God. And if we're a child of God, we should be looking and living with that in mind. Now, we may feel in the enemies of, uh, the enemies of, uh, uh, of, of God's family and God's church may feel like they have the upper hand, and many times they, it seems like in this life they do. Doesn't it? But make no mistake, do not be, you know, don't let them disappoint. Don't become disappointed because they win every now and then. You know, they will be the ones in the end that will suffer the wrath of the judgment of God, not those who are born again. This does not say that the charges and the sufferings in this life are not difficult. But what truly matters in the end are you a born again child of God? You know, the Bible says we are justified. One of the, one of, one of the uh, uh, works of God in our life as a child of God is that justification. And that's going to make a difference. And that, that means that we can come before we are justified, although we sin, although we fall short of the glory of God, we can still come boldly to the throne of God and find grace and mercy to help us in our times of need. So God has justified you. You're justified right now. And we will have an ultimate justification that will be fulfilled in, 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 the, in, in the future. And we have that assurance by the blood of Jesus, our sacrifice for sin, who has died, who was risen, who is now seated at the right hand of the Father and making intercession for us. We know the final verdict. We know the final ruling, ruling by the judge of the universe, the God who is God. Because we know the final verdict, the final decision of God, doesn't mean that we lay down and we don't fight the battle. It doesn't mean that we just give up and lay down. You know, the evidence for any case, <coughs> that which is true, just, honorable, right, still needs to be presented so that people can hear the truth, and be saved. That the, and that the judge is justified in his ruling for us and against those who persecute us. See, Jesus continually presented the truth and exposed the lies of his accusers and his enemies, even though they crucified him. He continually presented the truth. And in the end, they will fall under the righteous judgment of a holy God, and God's justice will be right against them. You know, uh, there's a proverb that says that when you hear only one side of the story, that person seems justified in their anger or their bitterness or their demands. 
But when witnesses or testimony is giving on the other side, then you have both sides of the story. And the, what the first story may not be quite as true and right as you first thought. That's why we need to continue to present the truth of God. Yeah, I think that has to do somewhat with the why of verse 36. Verse 36, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to the, for the slaughter. That's why God permits persecution, hardships, and trials and tribulations into our life. It's a testimony against those who reject him and a witness for those who love him and will be saved. God's judgments will be justified. Jesus said, remember this in John 15, 20. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. <clears throat> Exhibit four of our faith, verse 34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and forevermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. You know, how can the one who died for us, who suffered death for our sins and not his own, who has ascended to heaven, who is seated at the right hand of God the Father and makes an intercession for us, how can he condemn us? If he has done all these things, that, you know, that just doesn't make any sense. If he loved us that much, Endured all of that and is now at the right hand of the Father making an intercession for us. He suffered, died, risen, has ascended to the, to the right hand of the Father making an intercession for us. How can he condemn us? He can't. He, he won't. So we don't have to worry. I just use that. We don't have to worry. Sometimes people might say or ask, well, how do we know that God will do everything he says he's going to do? Could God not just be uh, playing tricks on us? Let me tell you, you do not have to worry about God not fulfilling his promises. If God, if, if, if all of this has taken place for your salvation and mine, God's going to carry it on to completion. In fact, we have that word from him in, his, in the Bible. We don't have to worry about God fulfilling his promises. That should never be an issue for us. What should be an issue, are you in Christ? Are you born again? Are you, have you confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord? And ask him uh, to come into your heart, forgive you your sins, and to be your Lord and Savior. That's the only true word. That's why I keep telling you, you know, look, examine your heart. I keep saying, <clears throat> examine your heart for the Spirit of God. <clears throat> That's what we should worry about. Do we know, do we know that we know that we know that we are a child of God? It's not about what you say with your mouth that matters, but it is who is in your heart. Who is alive in you in you? <clears throat> Revelation 3.20, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. The fifth exhibit of our, for our victory, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? If God or Jesus loves us this much and we have received him by faith and he is the sovereign God of the universe, who can ever separate us? He's omnipotent, omnipotent, omnipresent, all at once, no one is greater than he. There is no one like him but him. If we have God's love for us in Christ, then the answer is that nothing can separate us from his love for us. That guarantees our victory. That is a guarantee of our victory. Now, 
We have a list here in verse 35 of things that we face in this life. I, I see these as things that, we, that, that come against us as the children of God in this world. Tribulation, distress. Is this shall tribulation, distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or pearl, or the sword? These are all physical things that happen to us in this life, in this world. And as verse 36 tells us, the enemies of God see us as sheep to be slaughtered. The enemies of God are so blinded by their hate and prejudice and life, they don't see Christ or who we are in Christ. And right now, you know, what we've been going, what's going on in, in our in, in our country and around the world? Governors, judges, congressmen, senators, mayors, people in authority have declared the church and the children of God as non-essential. Many of them have, by their rulings, by their by, by their exertion of power, they have said, "Well, you know, you're really non-essential." I praise God for our president, Trump, who has stated that the church, the people of faith, they are essential. They're important. Many of the liberals and those on the left view us as, they view us, they see us as those in verse 36, sheep to be slaughtered at their convenience, pawns that are a hindrance to them getting what they want in the world. But do not, let me tell you this, do not let the world and their view of you take ownership in your life. Do not let them so persuade you that to, to believe that you are who they say you are. You are who God says you are. God says you're a blood-bought child of God. You've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. <coughs> you have an eternity. You have a home in heaven. Do not let the world and the enemies of God tell you, persuade you of who you are. You are a child of God, a child of the King. Jesus says, you're my sheep, that I love you. Jesus says, I chose you, I love you, I called you. I have great plans for you to give you hope and a future. You're my family and my brethren, and I will give you eternal life. Verse 37 tells us that we are more than conquerors. That we have the true, we are the true victors in life. We've already won the victory through Jesus Christ and by our faith in Him, and through our faith in Him as our Lord and Savior. John 16 33 says, These things, Jesus said, I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. 1 John 5, 4 and 5, for whatever is born of God, that's speaking of the new birth, being born again, whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, just in case of things in verse 35 that we face, as part of this world, just in case you're worried about those things that you don't see or even know about, let's face it, there are some things out there if we don't know about them, uh, we can't see them or whatever, sometimes we may worry about them. And they can and does cause sometimes people concern or trouble. We're told not to worry about them because Jesus created them. They were created by and through and for him. He is sovereign over all things, even the things that haven't happened yet and they're still in the future. He has all control over those things. Uh, let's look, look at verse 38. He says, Paul says, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, angels, principalities, nor powers, things present, things to come, basically the future, height, or depth, or any other thing, created thing. Jesus created, the Bible tells us, Jesus, all things were created by and for and through Jesus. He's in, he is sovereign all, even all of those things that we cannot see, whether in heaven, under the earth, beneath the earth, on earth, visible, invisible, powers, dominions, thrones, no matter who, you know, who has what, God is sovereign. He's in control. He says, and here's the promise. 
None of these things shall be able to separate you. Verse 39. Shall be able to save you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here again is our security. The exhibits of our victory that is ours in Christ. Yes, there are things in this world that can harm us, cause difficulties and hardships and trials and hurts and pain. Yes, there's things both visible and invisible <coughs> that bring suffering and pain and tribulations into our life. But they are all under God's control. And he has promised that we have the victory over them and over those enemies that cause them. His grace is sufficient for every need. His grace is greater than our sin. We can trust our ultimate victory in Jesus and deliver us through him, both now and in the future. And once you have been born again, you know, worrying over the future should never cause you to lose one minute's sleep. But in reality, we do, don't we? Even though we shouldn't worry about it, the future, we do worry about the future many times. But if we, let me tell you this, if you will focus on Jesus, the author and the finish of your faith, keep your eyes upon him, and believe and, and know in your heart that you are more than a conqueror. You have the victory through Jesus who loved us, who died for us, who was risen, who is at the right hand of the Father making intercession. When we know all that, we know we have the victory in Jesus. God has already predestined us to be made in the likeness of his son. He has already predetermined it and he will cause it to happen. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge and depend upon him and he will direct and make your path straight. The final destination of the children of God is a new Jerusalem. Always remember whatever struggle whatever difficulty, whatever hardship and pain or surfing or hurt or anything else you are going through or will go through, God is the one true God. He is sovereign over all things. And let me just close with verse 37 again. And all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Let's pray. Then, Father, we just thank you. No matter what hardship, difficulties, trials, or hurts that we face in this life, we are conquerors in life because of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Lord, if there's anyone who has not uh, confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior, anyone who has not, uh, Lord, came into that personal intimate relationship with you, Lord, I pray that through the preaching of your word, uh, Lord, they will begin to examine your heart, their heart. They'll begin to look into their life and make sure that they know that they know that they know as, as, as John the Apostle wrote, the, he said, these things that I have written that you might know that you have eternal life by believing in Jesus Christ, God's Son. Lord, I pray that, that, that everyone who listens to this message, Lord, will come to the, in that knowledge of knowing that they are a child of God. And Lord, and, they, and become witnesses for you. They receive the power that they need to overcome the difficulties that they receive the faith that they need to overcome the trials, the hardship, the hurt, the pain that they are going through. They'll receive the victory in their lives, both now and forever, through the precious power and the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In his name we pray. Amen.